right, so today we're going to be going into a study today that um, if you guys have not heard me preach before, uh, I'm going to say it again. I don't really like to just monologue. So I, I like people to dialogue with me. So just uh, feel free to just, you know, s share comments or thoughts and, and engage as we get into our study today. Our study today is entitled, or our sermon today is entitled, Naked in the Garden. And so before we start, let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to guide us in our study of his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have blessed us thus far with uh, the wonderful worship service, and we surely feel your presence here. Lord, we pray now for the Holy Spirit to open our hearts, open our minds, and al also, Lord, put words in my mouth that you want me to share and how it should be shared so that we may be blessed today. We may be blessed and edified by your word and that your word will also change us because we believe in the power of your word. And we ask for the Holy Spirit to attend us now as we open your book. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so today we're gonna explore a very strange story. And it's so strange, in fact, that you've probably never noticed this story before. And you're going to probably wonder, why is a story in the Bible? Okay, and the story is found in the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 14. This is a strange story. Very bizarre story. Okay, and I'm sure you ha probably have not noticed this before. And if you have, good for you. <laughs> but Mark chapter 14, and we're looking at verse 51. Mark 14, and what verse did I say? 51 and 52 to be exact. So we're just going to be looking at these two verses as we start off today. Now take a look at this. Tell me if you think that this is bizarre. All right, this is the story. By the way, let me just give you a little setting on where this text is found. This text was found at the night that Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was arrested, okay? And then after he was arrested, this story is mentioned only in the Gospel of Mark. It's not mentioned in the other Gospels. Only in the Gospel of Mark. And it's very strange. This is after Jesus gets arrested, and verse 51 says, and it reads, are you there? Say amen if you are. Amen. amen. It says, and there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body, and the young men laid hold on him. Hmm. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Now, why would the author include this story at the end of Jesus' arrest? It, it kind of seems like it's unnecessary, right? Why would you put this story in there? It's just so strange. Here's this man. He had a what? A linen cloth wrapped around his body. They lay hold of him, he lets go of the linen cloth, and he runs from the garden naked. Bizarre. Strange. So, it, it could have been better if they just left the story out, right? Why, why did they include that in there? And I've wondered about that for, for you know, quite a while as I noticed this passage. But I also noticed that when you study the Bible... You have to keep in mind that nothing is in the Bible that is unnecessary. Like there's a reason why that there are certain details in the Bible. And we have to discover why. Surely it is not just to fill more space on the page. Oh, there's a little gap here. Let's just throw this story in. No, that's not what the author was doing. 
The author was inspired to put this story in for some reason, but then the question is, what reason? Okay, so let's explore this story as bizarre as it is. You guys want to explore the story? Yes. See what we find out? This is a mystery, right? Why is the story in there? Okay, and so let's take a look. What we need to do when we study the Bible is we need to, what, when it seems like bizarre and, and obscure, we need to investigate. We need to observe details and try to see what emerges. It's like when you're on a forensic scene of a crime, right? You see a dead body in the room, okay? What are your questions? How did he die? When did he die? Who did it? With what did they do it? Right? All these questions, right? Why? So you can gather what happened. Right? So that's what we're going to do now. When we study the Bible, we should be studying with this analytical, investigative mind. Okay? So let's take a look here. It says here in verse 52, And there followed him... Wait a minute, stop right there. There followed him. What does that mean? He was followed. Who was followed? He was in a crowd that was followed? What, what else? Jesus. So this young man, was he following? Who was he following? Jesus. Okay, if you look at the context, when it says, and there followed him, this is in context, who's him? Him is Jesus, right? Because if you look at the previous verses, it refers to Jesus. So here is this man, he was following Jesus, initially. Okay, so we, we know that off the bat. Oh, why was he there in the garden? He was following him, for what reason? We don't know yet, right? So he followed Jesus question. Is it good to follow Jesus? Absolutely, right? No argument there. It's very good to follow Jesus. This young man, he was following Jesus, okay? But does following Jesus guarantee that you will make it to the very end? Only if you're faithful to the very end, right? On that condition. If you are faithful to the very end. But at any time, could that change? Oh, yeah. yeah, right? So how many people, let's just flash back to the Garden of Gethsemane. How many people were following Jesus before he got arrested? All his disciples were following him, right? We know this, right? They were all following him. And how many fled? All of them. So they were following Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. But then what happened? Those same people that followed Jesus, when he was arrested, they all fled. They fled. You know, that's, there's another passage in the Bible that talks about following Jesus in Revelation. You remember Revelation chapter 14? Revelation chapter 14, in the very beginning of that chapter, it talks about a group called the 144,000. Have you heard of them? Okay, they're, they're not, there's, not, there's, there's not a name given to them. They're just the number, of a, a, a group with this number, the 144,000. And describes this group as a very exceptional group. And it says that among the descriptions that the 144,000 were the ones that would follow the lamb, whithersoever he goes. That's what made them exceptional. They were following the lamb, whithersoever he goes. Wherever the path, wherever Jesus goes, however treacherous it may be, they would follow him all the way. Faithfully, right? This is definitely a picture of a faithful group that was following Jesus to the very end. And we should aspire to be part of the 144,000. Amen? Amen? We should. We should. That should be our, our um, what we strive for. 
So how many follow Jesus? The question is, how many would follow Jesus regardless of the consequences? Hmm. Yeah, regardless of the consequences, right? So here's this young man. He followed Jesus, right? What else do we know about this man? It says they followed him a certain, a certain, what kind of man? Young man. We don't know his name, but we know that he is young. A young man. Okay? So... What do you guys think of when you think of someone that's young? Huh? He has, he has growth ahead of him. Okay, what else? A little, could be a little naive. Okay, yeah, and young people could be a little naive, right? They could be a little curious. That could be good or bad. <laughs> right? What else? They could be interested. Interested, okay, in what? So related to curiosity, interest in, in things that are happening, that curiosity, okay, okay. What was that? Say that again. I didn't hear you. Teachable, teachable, okay. Yeah, yeah, so they're, they're teachable, moldable, is that what you said? Yeah, moldable, I didn't, I didn't hear, okay, good. So, yeah, moldable. Um, so, so there's, okay, so, so, so the good attributes, there's good and bad attributes to being young. All right? The good attributes is that you can be gung-ho, right? You could be passionate. You could be all into something and do it with all your heart because you have the energy to do it. Uh, open to learn, teachable, moldable, um, leadable. Okay, good Tra attributes, right? But... Negative attributes, we kind of mentioned, could be a little naive, could be a little gullible, could be a little inexperienced, right? Um, can make mistakes. How many of you have children? Yeah? Do your young people make mistakes? No, oh, not my kid. My kid is perfect. <laughs> no, they all make mistakes, right? You got to teach them. They, 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 even like babies, right? They fall, right? And young people have that tendency to make mistakes. And we got to be gracious to that, right? But here is this young man. He's young, right? And he's following Jesus. Oh, isn't it good for young people to follow Jesus? Yes. Amen. And here's this young person following Jesus, right? This young man, a certain young man, following Jesus. Jesus. Now, there was another story of a young man that wanted to follow Jesus. Remember that? In the Bible? Where in the Bible was there a young man that wanted to follow Jesus? The rich young ruler. Exactly. <laughs> he was rich and he was young. Rich and young. And what did he say? To he said to Jesus, Jesus, I will, I, I want to follow you. I'm paraphrasing, right? He says, I want to follow you. And what does Jesus say? What was that? It'll be a baggage. Get rid of his baggage. Get rid of his baggage. So he was saying, um, sell all you have. Sell, sell everything you have, give to the poor, and then come, follow me. Yeah, and what did the young man do? Yeah, the Bible tells us that he went away sorrowful. Why? He had so much stuff, and he just couldn't do it, man. He just couldn't do it. He's like saying, man, I got to give up all this to, to follow Jesus. You know, I got to give up my... No, I can't do that. So he left away sorrowful. Young. So much potential. Right? Right, right. He, he, he grew up in the church. He grew up right. He grew up no, uh, supposedly keeping the commandments. Yes, but that, that was the one thing that he couldn't give up. Right? It was a shame. Because that one thing prevented him from following Jesus. 
Now, back to this story. We know so far that he followed Jesus. We know that he was young, right? And also, what else do we know about this man? He was in haste to follow. Why? Because he was not fully dressed dressed or properly dressed. So something was kind of haphazard in the way that he dressed himself. Okay, interesting. Interesting. Um, What was draped around this young man's body? Having a linen cloth cast about or wrapped around his naked body. He was hiding something. He is afraid of being sought in the crowd. Okay, yes, that's apparent later on. We see that. Yes. Um, First of all, why a linen cloth? That's what they wore. Okay. All right. So, um, Okay, so the priests wore linen cloth in the Old Testament. Okay, okay. Um, what does a linen cloth represent? We talked about priest. Okay, purity of Christ. Okay. But is there anywhere in the Bible that tells us what the linen cloth represents? You can't remember? Okay. What does the linen represent? Go to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8. Okay, check this out. The question is, what does the linen cloth represent? Revelation chapter, what? What did I say? 19 and verse 8. You're with me. That's awesome. Revelation 19 verse 8. If you're there, say amen. Amen. Okay, and it says, and to her was granted her, speaking of the church or the bride of Christ, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in what? Fine linen, clean and white. And what is the fine linen? For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Fine linen represents what? The righteousness of the saints. Okay. So, this young man had a linen cloth. We know a linen cloth in the Bible represents the righteousness of the saints. Or righteousness. Right? So, this young man, he has this linen cloth draped around his body, cast about his body. So, that's how he wore it. Now, When a person wears a linen cloth like that, what does that tell you? They're very pious? Outwardly? Okay. Well, if you cast a linen cloth around your body, what does that kind of indicate to you? You, it, it, yeah, you just did it in a hurry. You didn't do, like, proper checking if your sleeves are on right and all those things. It's just, like, cast about in a hurry, right? So it indicates, just by the way, by this description, it indicates that it was carelessly drap- draped around him. That's how I see it. What do you guys think? Yeah? And maybe it's because um, he was in a rush. Who knows, right? It was not properly worn. If it was just draped around. It was uh, not... Pr- he's, and, and also, how do we know? He's not properly covered. Right? He's not properly covered. It's almost as if he kind of rushed to put that on. Rushed for what reason? We don't know yet. Okay? But that's what we know. But what was he? The Bible describes him as what? In in spite of the linen cloth, he was? We covered young. We covered that he followed. 
Now we're moving on. He was covered with the linen cloth, but it says that what about him? Even though he was covered with the linen cloth, he was described as what? He was described as naked. Okay? So get this. He's draped around with the linen cloth, but yet he is still naked. Are you following? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I could picture that. Yeah, just kind of had it around his waist or something, right? Yeah. So, so we see here, the Bible describes him as naked. Despite the fact that he is covered, he's naked. That's strange, right? But question, have you ever felt naked? Okay. Have you ever had nightmares that you were naked? I did. <laughs> You know, sometimes you realize you're like in a public place, like in a store, and all of a sudden in your dream you think, I'm naked, <gasps> right? And you just, you just get, you panic. Has anyone had that? Or was it just me? Okay. Okay, so we've all had those sort of, that, that, that kind of, we can, we can relate to that, right? That, that fear of being naked, right? So um, here is this young man. He's naked, but he, he's barely, he, he's just, he has a linen cloth draped around his body. So in other words, we can say, can we say this? Okay, tell me if you agree with me. Can we say that he is not fully clothed? Yes. yes. Okay. Can we say that he is also not fully naked? Yes. yes. Okay. So that's interesting. He's not fully clothed and he's not fully naked. Hmm. It's interesting that both of those descriptions fit this young man. He's not fully clothed, but yet he is not fully naked. You're, you're getting on the right track. Okay, but, 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 but it's almost like he is in this, he's not fully clothed, he's not fully naked, he's like this in-between state. Who's lukewarm. The Laodicean church, exactly. The Laodicean is, is the condition of the Laodicean church. Did you guys hear that? They're not fully hot. They're not fully cold. They are lukewarm. So this, this person who is not fully clothed and he's not fully naked, he is in that in-between Laodicean type of condition. Are you following? Hmm, interesting. Interesting. Okay, um, now let's think. Who else was naked in a garden? Adam and Eve, right? The first story in the Bible, right, in the Genesis. And, and they also, how did they become naked? Okay, what did they lose? They lost their innocence, they lost their righteousness, but also what did they lose that made them realize, I'm naked? The light, the light which was there? Covering. They're covering, right? So when they sinned, the light went out. Their covering was gone. They suddenly realized, oh, we're naked. Okay? So it's interesting. Let's take a look at this young man. What happens to this young man? We, we, we saw the descriptions. He was following Jesus. He was young. He had a linen cloth draped around his body. Okay, so we investigated all that. What was he doing? What happened to him as he was following Jesus? Okay? And it says in the end of verse 51... Who laid hold of him? Did, did the man touch Jesus? He laid, okay, let, let's read that carefully, okay? What does it say? Okay, it, just, it, it, it gives the description. We covered all the descriptions of this young man, but it tells us what happens to him next. What happens to him next? 
it says, and the young men laid hold on him. Okay, young, these young men laid hold on who? No. This young man that we were talking about in the beginning, right? These, a group of young men seizes or tries to lay hold of this young man that we're, we've been talking about. Are you following? Okay. Are we, are we clear on the story so far? Okay. So he's following Jesus. These young men, they lay a hold of him. Okay. They lay their hands on him. Right. And what happens? What happens? They lay their hands on him. And as they lay a hold, there's a young man, these young men lay a hold on them. What happens to this young man? What does this young man do? Okay, he fled, but how could he flee when they're holding on to him? They're holding on to the linen cloth. Okay, they're holding on to the linen cloth, right? Trying to grab him, trying to lay a hold on him. And this young man, what does he do in verse 52? He leaves the linen cloth. Why did he leave it? He didn't want to be apprehended. Yeah, he didn't want to be apprehended, so he let go of the linen cloth. Okay? So it's interesting. When he, why did he leave it? Because when you are naked, it's, a hard, it's hard to hold on to someone that's naked. Because you have nothing to hold on to, really, Right? So this young man, realizing that, he ditches the linen cloth, and they're grabbing the linen cloth, and he flees. Are you following? Are you following the story so far? So for his own well-being, he ditches the linen cloth, and in order to be freed. He ditches the linen cloth in order to be free to escape. Okay, but notice, when he fled, was he free? Was he free from their grasp? Yes. Okay, he was free from their grasp, but what condition did he leave in? He was naked. He was naked. So he successfully managed to avoid being grabbed by these young men, but he, in, in, in an effort to escape, he left naked, while leaving behind the linen cloth. So, you know, it's interesting that uh, in Mark chapter 14, verse 59, um, I think it's 59, was that right? No, I think it's the, it's the wrong verse, sorry. In, in Mark chapter 14, early in one of the verses, it says that all the disciples fled, remember? They all fled when Jesus was apprehended. This young man, he was supposedly following Jesus. The young men tried to grab him. In sheer panic, he lets go of his linen cloth and he runs away from the group that was trying to grab him naked. So, notice, what were they doing before they fled? Before they fled, they were following Jesus, right? They were following Jesus. You know, following Jesus is very easy when things are going well. When Jesus is popular. When Jesus is well liked, it's really easy to follow a person like that. But when people want to arrest you because of your association with Jesus, or they want to harm you because of your association with Jesus, it's not so easy to follow Jesus, then, is it? Is it? Yeah, it's a little harder. 
or much harder. And it's interesting, this man, he left in a state, in a condition of nakedness. You know, when Jesus died, it's interesting, he died how? He died naked on the cross, right? Jesus became naked in open shame, in order, and he forfeited his righteousness so that we could be covered with his righteousness. Linen cloth represents righteousness. So Jesus offers the robe of righteousness to who? Okay. Who does he offer the robe of righteousness to in Revelation? There's a specific group that he offers the robe of righteousness to. My sister's... Not the 144,000. is in Revelation chapter 3. It's the same group that my sister back there mentioned. The Laodicean church. Remember? He offers three things to the Laodicean church. Do you remember what they were? Gold, tried in fire. Robe. White raiment. And also, eye salve. So one of those three things is the robe of righteousness. The white raiment that Jesus offers, right? So the Laodicean church is interesting. It's interesting. Jesus offers the robe of righteousness to the Laodicean church. Why? Do you guys remember? What condition was the Laodicean church in? It was lukewarm, yeah, but among that, there's a lot of descriptions of the Laodicean church. They were naked, exactly. They were miserable, blind, and wretched, and naked, right? But they didn't know it. Was there a comment there? Are you raising your hand? No? Okay. So the ladies in church were also naked. And Jesus is offering the robe of righteousness to them because they're naked. Okay? So, if we accept that robe, by the way, we are all the latest in church. Did you know that? We're the, we are latest. We are latest here. And so that means this definitely applies to us. Okay, so when Jesus is offering that robe of righteousness, that white raiment, and if we accept that robe, is that good or bad? It's good. It's very good. You want that, right? So he gives us that robe. He offers it to us. He gives it to us. It's ours for the taking. However, after receiving the robe, is it possible to lose that robe? Yes. Yes. Just because you have it does not guarantee that you will always have it. There is the risk of losing it. Okay? And if you lose that robe, it has eternal ramifications, according to what the Bible tells us. Okay, so let's take a look. In Revelation, our scripture reading, Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Take a look here. Keep your thumb in Mark chapter 14. We will refer to this again. But Revelation chapter four. Uh, Chapter 16, yes, thank you. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. What does this say? Are you there? Check this out. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So Jesus is saying that he is coming as a what? As a thief. So what does that mean that Jesus is coming as a thief? Is Jesus coming to steal that robe? Is Jesus saying, hey, I'm going to give you this robe, but I'm going to steal it. You better watch out. Is that what Jesus is doing as a thief? No, 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 no. I don't think so. Right? What does it mean that he's coming as a thief? Yeah, when you least expect it, you never know when he's coming, right? So in other words, you have to always be ready and to always watch. 
Watch and keep your garments. Those are the two action words in that verse. Did you notice that? The two action words is watch and keep your garment. Because if you don't do those two things, what will happen? You will be naked and everyone will see your shame. So, why is Jesus saying he's coming as a thief? It's to be ready. Ready for what? It's because, get this, why is Jesus coming as a thief? Why does he call himself as a thief? Because of your association as a result of following him, your association with him, circumstances will one day change where everything will change against you because you're following Jesus. And when those unforeseeable circumstances come, they will take away everything that is yours and everything that you wrap your identity around can be taken away. Including your association with Jesus. And so Jesus is saying in this verse, how to avoid being naked in open shame. The two words are watch and keep your garments. You know, we know that Adam and Eve in the garden, they lost their garments. Were they in open shame? Yes, they were. They were in open shame. You know, in the garden of Eden, they all had the garments of light. Once they ate the forbidden fruit, they were naked. Okay? Cause and effect. You eat the fruit, you disobey God, you lose the robe. Okay, you're naked. So what was used to cover them after the fall? They used fig leaves, but that didn't do well. It didn't cover much. It wasn't adequate. And leaves wilt and wither and die, right? So what did they have to do? They had to use wool. Where did that wool come from? It had to come from an animal that had to die. That's right. So we see that the skin of animals were provided for them to cover them appropriately. And what does that represent? When the animal, skin of the animals, when an animal died to provide skin for them, what did that represent? Sacrifice of who? Jesus, right? So when Jesus sacrificed himself as the lamb, he was able to cover us. Okay? So, so, the, so the skin of the animals that covered Adam and Eve, they represent the death of Jesus. That provided a covering that was available to them. Are you following? Okay. So there is, it is at another garden that Jesus was securing the garment that he wanted to give us. Which garden was that? Gethsemane. Exactly. In the garden of Gethsemane, he was going through that anguish to secure that robe of righteousness. He was facing the cross. And once they accept that robe, Jesus knew he had to go through with it because once they accept the robe of righteousness, they would be following him from that moment on. Okay, but Jesus gives us warning, right? This warning that was found in Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Now, let me ask you this question. This warning is mentioned in Revelation 16. Do you know why or what's, what's happening around this verse, why this verse is mentioned? Do you know what's taking place? What's the context of why this verse is mentioned? If you look at Revelation 16, the whole context of Revelation 16, I don't know if you're familiar with prophecy. I love prophecy. Okay? But in Revelation 16, it is talking about the sixth angel. The sixth angel that pours out the sixth plague. And when he pours out the sixth plague, what does that bring on? That brings on 
what's called the biggest event in the history of the world called the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon. Okay? And what, and in this battle, this is the final battle. Right? This is the final do or die battle between good and evil. And the sixth angel pours out its plague, and it says that since this is the final battle, it says in Revelation chapter 16, and I just lost my place there. Oh, here it is. Revelation chapter 16, verse 14, the verse before our scripture reading. What does it say? It says, what's going on? What's going on? Look at this. It says, for they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So in other words, what is happening here? And immediately after this verse, it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest it be naked or be in open shame. So there is a, a clear, immediate connection to the previous verse with the verse warning us not to lose our garments. The previous verse says that there are spirits of devils working miracles. Why are they working miracles? What's the context here? What's happening here? They want to what? They want to fool the righteous to believing in them. Okay, yes, 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 absolutely. So in other words, these spirits of devils, they're doing what? They're working signs, wonders, miracles to gather and deceive people to themselves, right? And the devils are working miracles to gather everyone to their side. Listen to this. Watch this carefully. They're trying to gather everyone to their side. And it is at this critical moment that it's established, listen to me, at this critical moment it's established who you are determined to follow. Are you following me? In this critical moment, at this climactic event, it is established for every human being on planet Earth, who they choose to follow. So, if you decide to follow Jesus, people will lay hold of you. Are you following? If you decide to, if, if you, if you defo- decide to follow Jesus, people will try to lay a hold of you just as they laid hold of Jesus on that fateful night in the garden. If you decide to follow Jesus, they will bring you before the councils just as they brought Jesus before the councils. If you decide to follow Jesus, they will possibly scourge you and bring you before governors and kings just as they scourged and brought Jesus before governors and kings. If you decide to follow Jesus, those closest to you will betray you, deliver you up, and cause you to be put to death, just as Jesus was betrayed, delivered up, and put to death. If you decide to follow Jesus, you will be expected to be hated of all men and persecuted, just as Jesus was hated and persecuted of all men. Now, after knowing all this, do you still want to follow Jesus? <laughs> Let's be honest. You're like, ooh. <laughs> You're, the, 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 the yes is kind of hesitant, right? There's a lot that you have to go through in order to follow Jesus and to continue following him faithfully to the very end. But why Why do these things happen to you? Why would these things happen to you? You know, it's very simple. You may have to experience these things, but all these things are attempts by the enemy, listen to me, 
All these things are attempts by the enemy to get you to relinquish your robe. To relinquish what? Your robe. The robe of righteousness. Who gave you that robe? Jesus. Okay? The enemy knows that. The enemy knows that you have that robe, and guess what? That robe is as good as a ticket to heaven. And he knows that. So what does he do? He does everything he can to get you to ditch that robe. Just like that young man in the garden. People will lay a hold of you. People will target you for your association with Jesus. And what are you going to do then? Our scripture reading tells us we need to watch and keep our garments, no matter what. Are you guys following? The enemy wants to get you to relinquish that robe of righteousness that Jesus gave you, to discourage you also to stop following him. And brothers and sisters, it is not worth it. It is not worth it. Don't give it up. Like the disciples, we can flee as a result of being associated with Jesus, or we can be determined to follow him. You must, we must watch. And whatever you do, keep that garment, because the Bible tells us that he or she that endures to the end will be saved. In other words, they will not be found naked spiritually because they chose to follow him to the very end. Now, you guys are saying, okay, that's good and all, Pastor. I'll be ready when that happens in the future. <laughs> this doesn't apply to me now. But let's be honest. What difficulties are you experiencing now, brothers and sisters? How many of you guys have a difficult free life right now? You have no difficulties? I ask how many people here have no difficulties in their life? Okay, if you, get, if you raise your hand, wow, that's great. Praise the Lord. <laughs> okay, but what trial of fire are you experiencing right now? In fact, what trials are you experiencing for Jesus' name's sake? What temptations are you facing? each and every day. Do you know why those things are coming upon you in your life? Yeah. The reason why that you're enduring temptation, the reason why you're going through trial, the reason why difficulties come upon you when you least expect is because the devil knows that you are following Jesus. And because he knows you are following Jesus, he is bringing these things into your life to discourage you in an attempt to get you to forfeit that robe of righteousness. And without that robe, none of us will make it. Remember the... hmm, Remember the parable about the wedding garment? You guys remember that? Okay. What happened? Is that that, that was in Matthew chapter 22, verse 12, right? If you guys want to look up there. But in that parable, if you didn't have that wedding garment, what happened? You were cast out into outer darkness. All because you were found without the wedding garment. And what is that wedding feast that they couldn't take part in unless they had a wedding garment? Why do we need a garment for that feast? Do you remember the parable? What is that feast? Go to Revelation. Revelation chapter 19, again. Revelation chapter 19. What, the question is, what is that wedding feast? And why do we need a garment 
to that feast. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 through 9. Are you there? All right. If you're there, say amen. 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 Okay, here we go. It says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. What event is this? It's a wedding. It's a wedding of who's getting married? The saints? Who are they getting married to? Okay, does it say Jesus? Well, it, it does refer to Jesus, but what does it, instead of saying Jesus, what does it refer to Jesus as? As the Lamb. Very important. Stick with the language that the Bible brings out, okay? The marriage of the Lamb. So the, one, the, the bride is being married to the Lamb. The Lamb is Jesus. Okay? And in ver read, reading on, it says, And to her was arrayed, or granted that she should be arrayed with fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Verse 9, And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So back to my question. What is that wedding feast? It's the wedding between the lamb and his bride. Jesus and the church. Okay? That's right. And why is it important to have that garment? Exactly. They have to be covered by his righteousness. And who provided that? Jesus. Jesus. Exactly. He provided it for his bride. He provided it for us. Right? And so, who gave this fine linen? It was the lamb. Get this. Look at the connection. The lamb provided them their garments and fine linen. Who gave Adam and Eve coverings? The lamb. The lamb gave them their covering. Right? So you see a lamb giving a covering in Genesis. We see a lamb giving a covering in Revelation. Hmm. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage Supper of the Lamb. Brothers and sisters, we are all called to that marriage supper. And Jesus has provided that garment for us so that we are guaranteed a spot at that supper. But it's up to us to hold on to that robe with our dear life, literally. Now, What does it mean to have the robe of righteousness? Is that like a literal robe that I can just go to Banana Republic and say, you know what, I like a robe of righteousness that Jesus made. <laughs> Do you guys have that? Is, is, is it a literal robe? Okay. Okay, okay. That's close to what we're, we're, we're getting to here. So, the Bible tells us to do what? Watch. What are we watching for? We're watching for any and every opportunity that the devil puts in our path to get us to relinquish our robe. We've got to be watching. Okay, because the devil can blindside us and we can unbeknownst justify why we should ditch that robe. Right? We should watch. Second, it says we should keep our garments. Now the question is, if we are told to keep a garment, we need to know what that garment is. 
right? So from a practical aspect, what is the garment that we are to keep and guard? Our spirit, our faith in Jesus, the law. Okay, I hear all this. Okay, good, good, good. Our relationship with Jesus. Okay. I struggle with this. What is that robe? And how am I supposed to hold on to it if it's not a real robe? Right? And the spirit, okay? There's a book called The Faith I Live By. You guys heard of it? By Ellen White? This is what she writes in page 113. She says this. Listen carefully. This is really enlightening. She tells us what the robe is. So we need to know this in order to keep it. So listen to this. It says, when we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged with his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. And as a result, we live his life. And she says, this is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Did you hear what she said? How do you know that you're wearing the robe that Jesus gave you? It's if we, if our heart is united with his heart, if our will is merged with his will, if our mind is one with his mind, if our thoughts are all brought to the captivity of Christ, and we, as a result, are living Christ's life. You are becoming just like him. It's, it's literally putting him on. You're putting Christ on. And when those difficult things come and difficult people come into your life and the devil brings them purposely into your life, you get you to ditch that robe. How do you ditch that robe? When you stop acting like Christ. Somebody insults you, oh yeah, well, I'm going to get you, right? You just ditch the robe, right? Someone cuts you off in the street, ah, you're, you're honking, you're like trying to, you know, ram them and stuff, you just lost the robe, right? Your family member says something cr and, you, and you get cross with them, you just lost the robe. And the devil loves that, like, yeah, keep it going, keep it going until it, it all comes off, until it all comes off and you're, you're all naked, and that's, the, that's what the devil wants. He wants to put you in open shame. That's what he wants. Because when he puts you in open shame, you're in a state of guilt and shame, and that's where he wants you. And he wants to keep you there. But wearing the robe of righteousness means that our heart, our will, our mind, our thoughts are merged with Christ. And when we put his robe on in that sense, we are living his life by his grace. Only by his grace, right? And, and so what we need to do is every day we need to be watching, do I have the robe on? Do I have the robe on as I'm facing this difficult person or this difficult situation or this difficult circumstance. You need to be going into every environment watching with that in mind. Don't just go in blindly into a, a situation without ha knowing that you have Christ with you. Because then that's when the devil gets you. Every day. It's like in Michigan, right? When you see the weather outside and it looks really dreadful weather, you know that you've got to put a coat on, right? I'm from California, so of course I know this even more. I'm more, I, I feel it more than you guys. <laughs> but just as you are dependent on that coat to keep you warm before you go out into the elements, you need to have that same dependence on the robe of righteousness when you enter any environment. 
in this sinful world. And it's only Jesus, it's only Jesus that can help you weather the storm. And as long as you say, I'm going to hold on to this robe, you're saying, I want to continue following him. Though the heavens fall, though the earth opens up and swallows me whole, I will never stop following him. And you know you're following him. When somebody says something negative to you in your face, and you can just smile at them, and you can have love for them as Jesus would. And if you can react in that way, that definitely is a good indicator that you are wearing Christ's robe. You are wearing his character. And we need to keep it on all the time. We are his children. And he wants to see his likeness in all of you, in all of us. Because when he sees that, that's when he'll say, come my child, let's go home. Let's go home. Amen. So may the Lord bless you as you understand what the robe is and that precious robe that was paid on Calvary is available to you today. How many of you guys say, Lord, thank you for that robe? I, I cling with it and cherish it with all my life. How many of you guys say that today? Praise God. And do what you can, whatever you can, to keep it and to watch. Watch. And may the Lord bless you and keep you in all the days to come.